We all have minor accidents in wintry weather, like slipping and falling on ice. It's usually annoying, but it's nothing compared to narrowly escaping a deadly avalanche. Just to be thrown off a cliff by a second one a few hours later. That's the unbelievably true story of Ken Jones, a British hiker who was hiking in the Transylvanian Alps and had to deal with one of Mother Nature's fastest, deadliest disasters. Twice! Jones's solo climbing trip turned into a nightmare most people can't even imagine. Freezing in the mountain cold, buried under snow with broken bones, and worst of all, entirely alone. Jones found himself facing incredibly unfavorable odds for survival. So what did he do? Ken Jones was a 26-year-old student at Manchester University majoring in political science. He had an adventurous nature, perhaps arising from his time spent in the UK military. When he decided to venture out to Romania and hike Mount Moldovanu in Transylvania's Carpathian Mountains on his own, it wasn't an unusual feat for him. At 8,200 feet high, Mount Moldovanu is the highest peak in Romania. Jones arrived in Romania around New Year's Day and started the climb one cold morning in January of 2003. Though Moldovanu Peak has hiking trails full of climbers during the summer, in the winter it's mostly deserted due to the deep snow, cold, and generally harsh conditions. However, since Jones was missing his army days, he wanted to undertake this solitary hiking challenge to recapture that sense of adventure. He figured his experience of four years as a paratrooper and two years as a special forces soldier would help support him during his climb. The first few hours on the mountain went smoothly. Jones climbed up higher and higher at a good pace until a change in the weather, decrease in visibility, and a layer of deeper snow high up on the mountain slowed him down. As he was nearing the summit, a heavy snowfall started and the sky became opaque. Jones decided conditions were too poor to continue, so he would go back down and attempt the summit the next day. A slight tremor he had felt in the ground below him, combined with an unusual noise, increased his unease and further urged him to climb back down. As Jones was now descending a few minutes later, he heard the same strange noise again, but louder this time. Now it was unmistakable, a noise Jones was familiar with thanks to military training in mountains and wintry conditions. It was the sound of recent snowfall stressing the solid snowpack underneath creating dangerous conditions. Suddenly, he stopped dead in his tracks. The sound rang out a third time, very close to his position. This time, it sounded like the entire mountain was creaking under its weight. Fearful of what he suspected was about to happen, Jones dropped down on the ground and tobogganed down the mountain on his back. As he neared the forest, he stood up to find cover and heard what he feared the most, the loud crack that signals the start of an avalanche, like a whip crack magnified by 100. With few good paths of escape, Jones ran through the forest, adrenaline surging through his veins. He hoped a large clump of trees would divert the snow and protect him from the worst of the incoming avalanche. Refusing to look back, Jones could hear the quickening speed of the mass of snow hurtling toward him. It sounded like an entire airport full of planes taking off at once, combined with the constant machine gun-like snapping of tree branches being broken off in the avalanche's path. The air filled with snow shooting in all directions, the powder on the ground shot up, clouding Jones's vision, and he knew he was in the thick of it. Suddenly, the ear-piercing rumble of the snow continued down the hill in front of him. Miraculously, Jones was standing firmly against a tree for protection, still alive, well, and most definitely not buried under a Transylvanian avalanche. The brunt of the avalanche had missed him, and the trees had provided adequate protection from the full force of the disaster. Since avalanches have been known to tear out entire swaths of forest from their roots and even demolish entire towns, Jones's survival in the forest was far from guaranteed. His escape was nothing short of extraordinary. An immense wave of relief swept over him. He had narrowly avoided what could have been a deadly disaster. Jones resumed his climb down the mountain, looking forward to a night in his sleeping bag and an early summit tomorrow. A few minutes later, Jones stopped again. What he was hearing couldn't possibly be happening. But horrifyingly, there it was, a large crack echoing around the slopes and the same Boeing engine-like rumble starting to come down the mountain. Let's leave Jones in his truly unenviable position for a moment to look at what causes avalanches and exactly how enormous they can be. Avalanches can be caused by changing weather conditions, such as a recent storm or snowfall stressing a snowpack on a slope, or by human triggers such as snowmobiles, skiers, and explosives that destabilize the snowpack. When an avalanche picks up speed, it can reach 80 to 100 miles per hour while booming down a slope too fast for even the fastest animal in the world, a cheetah, that tops out at 75 miles per hour to outrun. Though we don't know the exact size of the avalanche hurtling towards Jones, it's safe to say that it was a medium to large size avalanche from his description of the snow. 
Medium avalanches can range from 165 to 655 feet and have a volume of up to 220,000 gallons. Large avalanches can range up to 2,000 to 3,000 feet and have a volume of up to 2.2 million gallons, or about the size of four full-size Olympic swimming pools of snow. Being buried under that would almost certainly be fatal. Now back to Jones, who was having the worst case of deja vu imaginable. Completely exposed this time, Jones ran down the hill knowing the avalanche was moving too fast for him to escape. The snow caught up with him, whiting out everything around him once again. This time, he wouldn't be as lucky as before. The avalanche picked him up off his feet and rolled him uncontrollably down the slope. Suddenly, Jones could no longer feel the ground. The avalanche had thrown him straight off a cliff, and Jones plunged around 75 feet or around seven and a half stories to the valley below. The avalanche rolled him further down until it smashed him against some trees and rocks. To understand the horrible predicament Jones was in, the general survival rate for avalanche victims depends a lot on the time of rescue. If an avalanche victim is found within the first 18 minutes, the chance of them surviving are more than 91%. So far, so good, right? These odds don't sound too bad. Here's the problem, if the victim is removed from under the avalanche within 19 to 35 minutes, the chances of them surviving plummet to 34%. After 35 minutes trapped in freezing snow without rescue, the picture starts to look really bleak really fast. Jones was alone. No one knew his exact location or that anything had happened to him. He had no method of communication. Worst of all, he would quickly realize that his leg was broken at the femur and his pelvis was shattered. The nearest town was 10 miles away. At this point, let's just say his odds of survival that day were about the same as him winning the lottery. When he regained consciousness, Jones tried to stand. His left leg immediately gave way under him, and indescribable pain shot through his entire body. Jones knew he now only had three limbs to work with and few supplies. His sleeping bag, poncho, rations, dry kit, first aid kit, and flask were gone. He was left with a Leatherman tool, a compass, two bags of crumpled up food, sausage rolls and cakes, and a length of parachute cord, a light nylon rope used as a general utility cord. He got one small stroke of luck. Looking around the darkness, he was relieved to see the glow from his head torch uphill. Painfully and slowly, he dragged his body up the slope to retrieve it, finding his hat along the way. As he descended again, he located his canoe sack, a bag for keeping items dry, with a pair of dry socks and a plastic liter-sized water bottle within it. By now, it was nighttime. Feeling his feet were dangerously swollen, Jones removed his boots and placed his legs inside of the canoe sack for protection against the cold. Retreating his arms and head into his upper layers like a tortoise so they could be protected, he fought sleep off almost the whole night, knowing that giving in could cause him to enter a hypothermic state. At the first light of dawn, Jones started making his way down the mountain. He knew there was a stream down in the valley and if he reached it, he could fill his water bottle and follow the stream back to civilization. Jones crawled from dawn until dusk, repeating the military commands and sayings he remembered from his training days to keep him motivated when he felt weak. Though he crawled all day, his progress was slow and he realized that he'd have to spend a second night out in the cold, exposed and alone. During the night, thoughts of his faraway friends and family flashed through his head. He thought of their comfort and ignorance of his predicament and wondered if he would see them again. Miraculously, he made it through another freezing wintry night outdoors. The second day, after more hours of painful crawling on three limbs, which was tearing up his hands and body, Jones reached the stream. He drank and refilled his water bottle, then continued crawling along the banks of the stream toward the nearest vehicle track he could remember encountering on his way to the mountain. Several times, he found his way completely blocked. Each time, he had to strip off his upper layers, throw them across the stream to keep dry, and either hop or swim his way across the freezing water. Then he would crawl further down and find his new path blocked by cliffs, forcing him to repeat this excruciating and freezing process. The third night, Jones was sure was his last. The symptoms of hypothermia, confusion, drowsiness, shallow breathing, a weak pulse and fumbling hands had completely set in, and he had lost all feeling in his right foot. A heavy snowfall had also started during the night. Though it seemed like bad luck at the time, it may have actually saved Jones's life. He awoke in a cocoon of snow which had helped keep his body temperature a few degrees warmer at night than it would have been, like an igloo. To this day, he believes this prevented him from completely succumbing to hypothermia that night. As Jones continued his descent the next day, the route bottlenecked, meaning Jones had to get into the freezing cold water one last time. Hungry, exhausted, shivering, and feeling utterly defeated, he swam on for what seemed like ages but again reached an impasse. By that point, he had been in the water for almost three hours and covered just under 330 feet thanks to his dead leg and weakened condition. 
He knew that if he spent much more time wet and cold, he would be dead. Jones managed to slowly and painfully climb out of the water, but in the process lost his right boot. As Jones continued his descent, he started hallucinating, convinced he was seeing food, specifically an iced pink Victoria sandwich, a specialty of his mother's. As the hallucinations intensified and started to include cartoons from his childhood and other sightings, Jones decided to keep his head down, looking straight at the ground in hopes the hallucinations would go away. Finally, he looked up and breathed a sigh of relief. He had reached the vehicle track, but there was still a lot more ground he needed to cover. Jones found a sturdy stick and used it as a makeshift crutch to cover more ground. With a renewed enthusiasm now that he had reached signs of human life, he was still a few miles away from the town of Fagarash and certainly some distance away from reaching the first person on the outskirts of the village. After about 1.9 miles, Jones glanced up and saw a house. For a moment, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. For four days and three nights, he'd crawled down the frozen mountain in a desperate search for help without encountering a single human being. Even a sighting of Dracula's castle would have been welcome. Suddenly, there was an actual house and a man inside the house watching TV. He knocked on the door, realizing his mangled appearance might scare the house's occupants. An old man answered, with a younger, larger man not far behind him. Though at first they were apprehensive, once they realized Jones' weakened state, the younger man carried him in and offered him a drink, food, and a change of clothes. The men also fetched a boy from the village named Bogdan, who spoke some English to help translate. At this point, Jones was starting to feel weak. After Bogdan's arrival, on the verge of passing out, he faintly asked for an ambulance. After stopping at two smaller regional hospitals that didn't have the equipment to even attempt to treat him, Jones had to ride over three hours to a city hospital in Brashov, where he was admitted. However, as many people say, bad luck comes in threes. After surviving two avalanches and miraculously making it to a hospital, you would think Jones's ordeal would be over. However, the 26-year-old Brit wasn't in the clear just yet. Jones was hungry, frostbitten, and emaciated. His ordeal had left him quite a bit worse for wear, but he hoped that in the hospital he would make a speedy recovery. Then, in a few days in, something changed. Jones started deteriorating rapidly. The stress of his torturous ordeal had wreaked havoc on his internal organs, and most importantly, his stomach. After several days of unbelievable stress on the mountain, hyperactive acid levels in Jones' stomach had perforated his stomach lining, spilling out acids and other toxins throughout his body. Jones went into shock and doctors thought he would die. He even remembers seeing a member of his medical team apologizing to his mother for not being able to save him right before he blacked out completely. But the ex-military hiker had one more trick up his sleeve. After doctors removed two-thirds of his stomach and his duodenum, not only did he make a full recovery, becoming stable enough to return to the UK after three weeks in Romania, after months of intensive physical therapy and the help of a top hip surgeon, the man who doctors said would never walk again got up to walk, almost two years later. Today, Jones leads a very active lifestyle, training intensely as a cyclist. His experience of survival on the mountain is still something he carries with him, and Jones said it's opened him up and given him a new perspective. That cold January in Romania, Ken Jones was hit with two waves of bad luck in the form of massive, deadly avalanches. However, his incredible survival has become an inspirational story of what people can achieve when faced with the impossible and a testament to the unbelievable endurance of the human mind and body. Now we have a challenge for you, though it's going to be a bit easier than what Ken Jones had to go through. And that's choosing which video to watch next. We've got another great survival video over here, or if you're ready for something different, pick the video over here instead.